Welcome to the Leadership Lounge, a place to kick back and listen as our experts dissect some of the biggest questions leaders face today. I'm Emma Coombe, Managing Director in our London office. In today's episode, we're talking about what new leaders get wrong, but we're also remembering that failure and learning from mistakes is a really good thing. Becoming a leader is a hugely exciting milestone, but it's also a daunting one if you're stepping up to the C-suite for the first time, or indeed taking on that really coveted CEO role. The stakes are high, probably none more so than for a CEO, but leaders more broadly are going to have to make big decisions with ambiguous amounts of information. Leadership is more scrutinised today than it ever was before. And of course, every action that a leader takes is amplified throughout an organisation. Mistakes can have a huge impact, both for employees, but also more broadly for stakeholders and investors. Couple all of that with the fact that the current business climate is turbulent at best, and we can see why leaders' jobs are so incredibly complex. So how can CEOs put their best foot forward? What sets successful leaders apart? And what are the common pitfalls? How can they be avoided? Before we dive in, and I can't wait to hear some of our leadership advisors talking on these topics, Remember to share any burning questions you want our experts to answer by emailing redefiners at russellreynolds.com. It would be great to hear from you. It's time to speak to some of our experts. First up, we'd like to welcome Shannon Knott, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates Atlanta office. Shannon, in your role, you coach lots of new leaders through their appointment and beyond. What are the common things that you see new leaders getting wrong? New leaders are often really surprised that it is no longer their job to have the right answer. In fact, many times it's precisely not their job to have the right answer, but rather to develop a capable group of leaders who who know more than they do. If you always have to be the smartest person in the room, you actually have a negative impact on those around you and their capability uh, to grow will be stifled. And of course, in turn, your potential will be limited because you're so busy proving yourself that you're not focused on really improving yourself. Exactly, Shannon. Such a big part of the CEO's role is ensuring that they have the right leadership team by their side. It's no longer like it was previously where the CEO was the lone wolf meant to be the person answering every question and solving every problem. The most successful CEOs today are those who empower, inspire a really great group of leaders who then can work effectively together. In fact, we've done some research here at Russell Reynolds, which has proven just this point. CEOs who are surrounded by really high-performing C-suite leaders are much more effective at managing complex initiatives and more effective at attracting more top talent. If you want to succeed as a CEO, of course, without question, the best way to achieve this is to have the right team in place around you. It's all about what we at Russell Reynolds call top team effectiveness making sure that the leadership team is working really effectively together and collaborating properly. Gone are the days where a CEO was meant to be all powerful at the top and then have these very individual one-on-one relationships. Today, it's all about bringing that collective capability together. So Shannon, do you have any other pearls of wisdom for new leaders? You aren't supposed to be perfect. Vulnerability and yes, even imperfection create trust and build connection. So admit your mistakes, be humble, ask for help, demonstrate vulnerability. These behaviors will catalyze followership. Oftentimes, new leaders have this mixed conception that they're supposed to be infallible, but this only perpetuates a culture that won't take risks, won't set goals. And a final one, and and this is rather obvious, but change takes longer than you think. You have a lot of really ambitious goals coming into a new leadership position, but if you run too fast, you're going to lose those around you. So pace yourself and you'll be able to bring others along. Exactly, Shannon. Imperfection isn't failure. CEOs aren't superhuman. They have flaws and things will go wrong. But when CEOs admit their flaws and mistakes, they create a sense of trust and authenticity that others will then follow. And your point about pacing yourself is really interesting too. Whilst I I totally agree that taking time to understand a company is really important, there is one area where changes should be made quicker than others. We recently interviewed a group of CEOs across a whole range of sectors and geographies. And when we asked the question, what would you do differently if you had this transition again? 
over 80% said they would have moved faster on hiring or replacing members of their executive team. Of course, you've got to be confident you're making changes for the right reason. But when it comes to leadership changes, we find that people so often have a gut instinct of what it is they should be doing, but they fight it because it's awkward, because there are dynamics that make it difficult to face into a decision to ask someone to move on. And that just delays progress and delays having the right top team in place. It's time to hear from another one of our colleagues. We'd like to welcome Joey Burke. He's a leadership advisor in our Russell Reynolds Chicago office. Joey, what mistakes or missteps have you seen new leaders make? What I found with new leaders is that the interview process can lead to a degree of overconfidence and thinking that they understand what this new role actually entails. Um, I think the best leaders walk in with a degree of humility and with a learning orientation and a seeking to understand what it is they don't know. But for example, I was working with a client who was an internal transfer to a new business unit within a large matrix organization. She didn't even change companies. And she was completely caught off guard by how things were done within the new business unit. It took her a better part of a year to learn the people, the systems, and how to excel as a new leader. And thankfully, you know, we were able to assist her and talk her through it. But she was under the impression that given that it's the same company, Despite being a new leader, she should be able to understand what's going on. And that it was overconfidence. That was not the case. If the surprise for new leadership is overconfidence, then I think the solve is a degree of humility and seeking to understand what you don't know rather than immediately putting into action what you think you do. Yes, you're absolutely right, Joey. When you walk into a new role, you've got to be prepared to not have the most information or experience about the role or company. Be really ready to learn and listen. Part of the learning, in my mind, is also making sure that you have the right mechanisms in place. I'll turn in just a moment to our colleague, Dr. Ty Wiggins, who leads on our transition advisory program. But before I do that, I just wanted to flag the value of this service, because what Ty does when he supports senior executives with leadership transitions is take feedback from all of the key stakeholders that he's interacting with, often at around the six week to two month mark, and then again at about the nine month mark. And by gathering all of this feedback, hearing what those people expect to see more of, what they would like to see less of, how actions are landing, allows individuals to respond accordingly and therefore more quickly become effective in their roles. But that's just one small part of our transition coaching offering. And Ty, it's great to have you in the Leadership Lounge today. You're based in our London office. And the question that I'd really like to ask you is, what do you think the common pitfalls are that new leaders often fall into? So common pitfalls with leaders in new roles centre around their attitude to what has made them successful in the past. So when I see leaders making mistakes early, they are often things like trying to move too fast, trying to um, assume ahead of time what they're going to do. If you think about taking on a new role, it's one of the points in time when we are very vulnerable. We've just been very successful at a certain role at a certain organization, and we're essentially starting again. We're starting without the social capital, without the credibility. And so we tend to get into an anxiety state where we really want to prove to the organization, but also to us, that we are the right person for the role. And then the other aspect is At every level that a leader goes up in terms of uh, level of role, there's aspects of things that worked for them in the past that no longer work. And this is a real challenge. And we see this a lot with leaders who are great executors, people that carry the mantle of, I'm someone who gets things done, then gets to a point when their role is to lead people who get things done, the execution, getting involved. It comes across as micromanagement and it creates an ongoing period of stress. The other thing that I see is that Leaders spend a lot of time in what I call the above and the below, which is I pay a lot of attention to my new direct manager and I pay a lot of attention to my team. But early in a new role, I don't do the horizontal or diagonal work. And what happens is down the track, when the leader's trying to get things done, they realize that they haven't invested enough time in these horizontal relationships, in the peer relationships, and it stalls them and again, sort of frustrates them. Indeed, Ty, making that shift from being the executor to delegating isn't always plain sailing. 
The skills that you require as a CEO are different to those which you've honed in previous roles. For example, you might have been advised in the past to value authenticity. And whilst I fully subscribe to bringing your true self to work, as a leader, it actually is incredibly important to keep your ego in check. It's all about putting the feelings of others in front of yourself, not focusing on what you feel, focusing on others. A Forbes article coined this as the dark side of authenticity, which really resonated with me. It's all about the ability to display the best version of you, but not that unfiltered, uncensored, uninhibited, authentic version. Another element that new leaders need to become comfortable with is constructive conflict, which can be difficult to adjust to if you've always been well-liked. Someone who'd like to speak on this point and who we're lucky to have in the lounge today is David Lang, a leadership advisor in our New York office. David, how important is it that new leaders are comfortable with constructive conflict? One of the things that we know and recognize about leaders stepping into new roles, and especially roles on the C-suite and as CEOs, is that a lot of the skill set around relationship management, building collaborative skills, and creating harmony, this idea of being well-liked and admired, which contributes very strongly to people's success and upward mobility, that this skill set actually sometimes needs to be moderated and even changed into one of being comfortable with productive and constructive conflict. A lot of the decisions that end up in the C-suite or end up in front of a CEO are decisions that cannot be made anyplace else. And they are decisions that require full and complete buy-in from everybody around the C-suite or around the CEO. That often requires debate, differences, and even conflict. And C-suite leaders and CEOs need to be comfortable with this dynamic on their teams. This is especially challenging for those leaders who have grown up again in a culture of harmony with real positive relationships around them. We even go so far as to actually require CEOs and C-suite leaders to be proactive in the way that they solicit conflict and constructive debate from their teams so that nothing remains unsaid around the critical enterprise-wide decisions that require complete buy-in and complete alignment in order to execute them in our biggest clients. Yes, being able to deal with conflict is such an important quality, David. And then as a leader, creating a team that feels comfortable having really honest constructive conversations. It starts with creating safe spaces where more direct discussions that are honest and empathetic can take place. Then as a new leader, once you've mastered this, you can really get off to a flying start. Our time in the lounge today has come to an end. In 30 seconds, this is what we've learned. Leaders don't need to have all the answers. Instead, they need to develop a really capable top team around them who can work effectively together. Imperfection is not a bad thing in the leadership space. In fact, recognizing your weaknesses can be incredibly powerful. Don't run before you can walk. Timing is critical when implementing change as a first-time leader. And what has made you successful in the past won't always make you successful in the future. Take time to adapt and reflect. For more dynamic insights from our leaders, listen to Leadership Lounge wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have any topics or burning questions you'd like us to cover in future episodes, please get in touch. Email your questions to redefiners at russellreynolds.com or you can find us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at RRA on Leadership. Look forward to seeing you next time.